the recorder now. Thank you. Um, welcome to the, Cal uh, the, the Community College Consortium for OER um, Fall 2019 webinar on equity, diversion, and inclusion in OER. That was not a great start. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, I am one of the regional leads for California's OER initiative, and I'm also a member of the Professional Development Committee for the CCC OER. So I'll be moderating today. Um, but first, let's do a, a quick uh, run through of the agenda. We'll first do some introductions and then talk a little bit about what CCC OER is and what we do. Um, and then we'll hear from three presenters. Um, one at uh, River Parishes Community College, one at San Jacinto Community College, and then one from BC Campus. So we'll get a nice view of, um, a nice broad view of how equity, diversity, and inclusion are uh, accomplished. Then we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay, so let's introduce the speakers. Um, and we'll just go in order. Esperanza, can you introduce yourself, please? Mm -mm. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Esperanza Zenon. I'm a physics and physical science instructor at River Parishes Community College. Uh, we're about a 3,500 student campus located in four areas between Baton Rouge, Louisiana and New Orleans, Louisiana. And it's a pleasure to join you today and talk about some of the things that we're doing regarding OER on our campuses. Um, and uh, again, thanks for inviting me. Hey, Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki Whiteside. I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Instructional Innovation and Support at San Jacinto College. We are located in the Pasadena and Houston, Texas area. Uh, we have uh, four campuses, soon to have a fifth, and very excited about uh, what our program that we call Open Books. I'm responsible for that in addition to uh, instructional design, distance learning, and, and all those other fun things people like to uh, send my direction. So we get to do a lot of work with faculty, focus on innovation and focus on ways to get students excited about uh, instruction and going forward. So I look forward to talking with you today and thank you for having me. Thank you. Lori? Hi, I'm Lori Asup. I'm uh, the manager of Open Education in, at BC Campus. Uh, we're located in British Columbia, Canada, and we have two main offices in Victoria at the southern end of Vancouver Island and in Vancouver. We also have several staff who work remotely. Uh, BC Campus has about 30 uh, staff and a third of those work in open education. So the open, uh, open education portion has been going on since 2012 and BC Campus itself uh, since 2003. So I too look forward to telling you what's happening in British Columbia. All right, so if we could go to the next slide, we'll talk a bit about uh, CCC OER's mission. So we are a subgroup of the Global Open Ed community, and um, the CCC OER is a community of practice dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of open educational resources to enhance teaching and learning. Um, and as part of that, we're trying to we're working on building a community of professionals. So you, uh, if you open your chat, you'll see folks are introducing themselves, and if you want to introduce yourself as well in the chat, that would be lovely. Um, we're bound to support Canadian College mission of open access through creating awareness and development of openly licensed, low-cost educational materials to make college more affordable and accessible for students. We also provide regularly scheduled um, webinars, and this is one of those. Um, and part of what we do, like I said, is a little community of practice. So in the next slide, you can see where all of our members are located. So we're all across this, um, the country, 90 members in 34 states. And we have two members, uh, two new members this time, Trinity Valley Community College in Texas and Public Community College in Kansas. So what are those folks? Suzanne, yeah. I hate to interrupt you. You're breaking up really badly. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yikes. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. My mic is going up. I only have one more slide, so I'll, uh, I'll kind of let's move on from that. Suzanne, you know, you might turn off your video. Sometimes that helps. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Is that better? Um, okay, so next slide. Is that at all better? Yes, uh, that is better. Thanks. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so equity, diversity, and inclusion is a longtime theme of CCC, and each webinar is specifically focused on this topic. You can also find um, a great blog on our homepage. So you're looking at our homepage and um, the blue box will take you to the blog. So Liz, if I could ask you to put the um, the link to our homepage in the chat, that would be helpful. So you're, you're welcome to check out the blog. If you're interested in being a guest contributor, we encourage that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter. Um, and I should mention the Q&A directly after each presentation. Is uh, needing to get back to her classes, and so we want to give her the opportunity to do that. Um, so, Esperanza, thank you for, for being here, and if you want to take it away. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Um, again, I'm Esperanza Zenon. I'm glad to be here with you this afternoon to talk about some of the OER um, projects and initiatives that we're undertaking at River Parishes Community College and how that ties into this whole uh, business of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> next, next one if you don't mind, yeah. So just a bit of background uh, regarding a little bit about how I got involved in the, the OER process and projects here at River Parishes, and then some of why this is important for our students particularly. So back in 2016, uh, a colleague from Northwestern University, which is in the northern port, part of Louisiana, had a grant project regarding developing affordable resources in English, math, history, and science. <clears throat> and they chose the introductory level courses to, to pilot. And so uh, I was invited to develop, to review some open resources for physical science, which is one of the disciplines that I that I work in, I, I teach physical science and physics, and most recently fluid mechanics for the process technology program here. And so um, I was excited about getting involved in that project and reviewing open materials. But at the time, I wasn't actually using what I would call <clears throat> legal open resources. I'll put it that way. My students didn't incur any costs where materials were concerned, but I wasn't completely educated about the whole OER process and the legalities and the copyright and all those kinds of things. And so the more I learned, the more I was able to incorporate those resources. And then a group of us on this campus, about six or seven of us decided that using open resources would really be to the benefit of our students. Well, about the time that we made the decision that we were gonna move in that direction, just in our little cohort, our system office uh, came, published the initiative, of, they call it Goals 2020. And one of those goals was to double the numbers of graduates to 40,000 and we started thinking about one of the things that impacts 
that number would that would impact that number of course is how red how readily available were resources that the students need to be needed to be successful um, <clears throat> So just in digging to know more about our students, I found out that roughly a little over 60% of our students receive financial aid of some kind. And I didn't know it at the time, but we are also, even at a community college level, considered a minor minority serving institute, which means we have a, a fairly large percentage of our students that are minorities. And so, we knew immediately with those stats on the table that <clears throat> finding resources that were affordable for our students would be key in addressing the colleges and the system goals, but also it would be very beneficial for our students across the board. And so I also started investigating just in asking students who would come to my classes, what were some of the hindrances of them getting the materials, textbook materials I'm referring to, that they needed right up front? And I found what a lot of research that I've seen suggests um, one of the major hindrances is dealing with, that, dealing with the bookstore format that the college, many colleges use. Um, and so they were finding ways to cope with that by maybe getting all the books, not purchasing them, sharing, all of those other um, methods to address this idea of the cost. So we, we knew that this whole idea of the cost was a major factor for our students. Um, if we were going to have this inclusion and promote success in our particular student population, which runs the gambit. We have the 18-year-old the 18 coming out of high school. We have people who haven't been in school in 20 years. Uh, we have people that work, have families, just like on many community colleges, college campuses. Um, and so we could hit that diversity and equity piece on a lot of levels with a lot of students simply by finding ways to cut the cost for them. And so we've, we've been choosing to approach things from that perspective and working diligently with the system office to promote various projects. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so you know, when it comes down to equity, this idea of reducing costs is key for our students because we can, we can reduce their matriculation time, meaning they can get out of school faster. And, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Because if you're not spending monies on textbooks, we found that students take more classes. When we look at our headcount, we don't see a substantial increase or decrease in the numbers of students we have but we do see an increase in the number of credit hours that they're taking. So we're, you know, we're not at a point where we can say that reducing the cost for our courses directly impacts that, but we do know that since we have taken on the initiative of reducing costs, we see those credit hours increase. So we're suspecting and hoping to investigate whether there's a, at least a correlation. We won't say cause and effect, but at least a correlation may be between uh, the numbers of credit hours that our students are taking and the fact that we've reduced costs for them through uh, our affordability initiatives. Next slide, if you don't mind. So I'll talk about a few things that we're, we're undertaking. Um, the first uh, project is the use of resources from uh, CK-12. CK-12 has a variety of open resources and our math faculty have uh, really embraced utilizing CK-12 uh, resources in the introductory level 
classes like our developmentals and um, and algebra, the the algebra one kind of course that they teach we teach here. Um, and the nice thing about that CK twelve resource is that it's um, it's it's a totally free kind of uh, resource that our faculty are using. And they found it useful because of some of the more engaging type activities that it offer. I won't go into a lot of details about that because as they mentioned to you, I'm, I'm catching the, I'm, I'm actually had a class that started at two, but they're waiting for me nicely until 2.30. Of course they can't leave because they have midterms anyway. So they're gonna wait until I'm ready, until I get there, but I don't like to keep them, uh, and I don't want them to put the 15 minute rule in effect on me. Uh, I told them I'd be there around 2.30. So I won't get into too much detail on the CK-12 part, but it's one of the way, one of the tools that our fact faculty are actively using to impact this idea, this cost factor, which we know that's the whole goal of OER in the first place, but it, um, it's, really important here on our campus to to find those ways because again we're dealing with a large population of students who are traditionally um underrepresented and so anything we can do to to promote lower costs is going to have is going to have uh, some affects where equity is concerned. And we, we, we um, you know, we, we know that, uh, well, if we can find ways for, for all of our students to do well, then we know we can definitely impact certain populations of students. Uh, another great project that we've engaged in is through OpenStax. Um, I see Nicole is, is on the call, so um, I can speak directly to this partnership. I, I utilize OpenStax materials in my class, um, in my phys physics classes, and my fluid mechanics classes. And it's turned out that this is a really great partnership for our college. Um, their OpenStax materials are being used be beyond just my classes. I know there are math faculty who are using them. Um, our chemistry faculty are using them. Um, I do know that there are some faculty in uh, some other areas that are using them as well. But the partnership that we enjoy with them is through our system office. We were one of the um, institutions and when I say institution, I mean system-wide for us that were chosen to participate in a partnership with OpenStax. And it's really been beneficial to us. Again, the, the, the mindset here for us on this campus is anything that we can do to make this education process cost beneficial for our students, then we know we're Able, we're touching students who, who may be traditionally having to make choices about do I buy the book or do I buy groceries? I mean, I tell folk a lot of times that you'd be surprised to know the number of single parent households that we, um, where we are dealing with that single parent and they're trying to be successful. Uh, I give you a, a story that happened to me about three weeks ago, I had a young lady who was in one of my online classes where I'm utilizing the OpenStax materials. And she came to me having a bit of a struggle. Um, she came to me and said she was having trouble getting a textbook for my course. And I said, what do you mean you're having trouble? She said, well, honestly, I didn't purchase the textbook for your class because my, my kid has been ill and I've been dealing with that back and forth with the medication and the cost and, you know, and she didn't have insurance. And she didn't realize that my textbook was totally free. And honestly and truthfully, when I told the student, ma'am, you could have ha had access to my textbook a long time ago because it doesn't cost you anything. She literally, literally hugged me in tears because 
she thought she was going to have to drop out of the class. And so I, I know I've had many experiences with students where this is real for them. This whole idea of being able to be included because they can afford it is a real phenomenon. So the other uh, resource that I use quite a bit in my classes are FET simulations. There are some wonderful, free, open, and really engaging simulations offered by FET. Um, they have science, they have some, and math, um, and earth science simulations that they, that they uh, have available. And the nice thing about that is that they also have um, activities to support these simulations. So it makes the whole process of adopting those simulations really, uh, really uh, a simple, a fairly uncomplicated process. Um, I've also found that when when I talk when I I started thinking a little bit differently about equity when I realized that these simulations were really helpful to those students who were more visual in their learning and who needed that visual stimulation. So um, you know, equity has a lot of different tentacles and through these resources, we're able to really reach out and branch out in the numbers of students that we're serving and engaging on a lot of different levels. Uh, next slide. So I, you can skip over that. I just was showing some of the resources, uh, OpenStax as well. You can keep going, Fed. Okay. Now, one area where we are really trying to grow our capabilities and offerings in OER is in our technical programs. A lot of people don't typically think that you can use OER in technical programs because they're so hands-on. For example, you, you, most people wouldn't think there are OER resources that you can use in welding. And yet there are ways to incorporate that. Now, to be honest, the slowdown for me at this point is really having the resources and incentives on my side of the house to help me partner with those technical faculty. They aren't necessarily uh, instructional designers, but through some engaging, some projects that I've been involved in, I, I've kind of developed that skill and I want to partner with them to make that uh, the OER a real um, integral part of what they're doing in their courses. So I'll just uh, scroll through and share very quickly some, uh, some resources that I've come across in these areas through this uh, engineering tech technology simulations for learning. They have some excellent simulations that can be incorporated into technical uh, areas uh, and, and they're open and free, freely available. And so um, I'm, I'm I'm starting to get that word out more that we can do this on the technical front as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Manufacturing in engineering through Wisconsin Online. Some great resources. You can see on the screen one um, uh, engineering drawings, uh, uh, orthographic projections. All of these, this is drafting kind of stuff, and they have uh, similar. They have resources that you can build upon in those areas. Next slide. <clears throat> Again, I highlighted the welding. Um, there's a big push in our, in our, on our campus and in other, uh, in, in some of the other community colleges to really engage females where welding is concerned. And so, um, we, we definitely want to be inclusive. We found that females make, well, finally, they figured out that females make great welders because of their attention to detail. And what I'm trying to do is make that whole process um, more aff affordable for them, for, for not only for the males, but for, for the student, female students as well, through developing these OER resources. Um, my hope is that at some point I can have data to support the idea that um, by moving to these OER resources in the tech programs, we can 
I want to see how much we can grow the, the female participation in some of those programs. Uh, next slide. Industrial automation. We just turned in a grant to the National Science Foundation where we had to specifically address this idea of diversity and inclusion. And one of the sources that we're going to be utilizing to develop some resources for that whole grant project is through this, um, uh, this Wisconsin online and, and particularly in industrial automation. And then uh, this other nice source that I found, 180 Skills. Um, they, they have some great uh, resources and tools that you can freely utilize. Um, there, there, there's a link there that's called Skill, Skills Course Library. And there's, uh, there, there are resources that you can build on there as well to incorporate OER in technical programs. <clears throat> And so then, you know, um, in terms of incorporating OER resources or the plan for incorporating OER resources, um, we found out just last week, we, um, the system kind of sent some information our way. And RPCC is really like kind of at the forefront of this whole OER movement. We're, we're getting more faculty involved more and more into this whole process because we know it's going to be beneficial to our students. If you want to grow the representation of students who typically aren't represented, then you've got to make, you've got to find creative ways to do it. And um, we, we know that as faculty, we can't impact a whole lot of other things but we can definitely impact what resources we use in our courses. That can be our way of contributing to the, uh, the whole idea of being more inclusive and, and encouraging more diversity by simply reducing what it costs for a student to take our class. Um, and so we're going to be really, really looking at that hard um, across the board because our our chancellor has a policy that he's been, a, a, a motto that he's been saying, textbook free by 23. By 23, he wants every single one of our courses to be OER in some respect. Next slide. Um, what we really need though, and I don't know how, if other community colleges are having these discussions, we really need these tech, tech advisory bodies to set, uh, boards and bodies to step up and, and fight for us to be able to move away from these proprietary materials. When a student taking a course is bound by that, um, they, they have to use those materials in order to be credential, it really ties our hands there because we can't reduce the cost if we can't, we don't have any flexibility where, where the materials are concerned. So we know that if we can crack that, you know, crack that, uh, solve that issue, then it's going to reap dividends for our students. We're going to be able to, um, you know, work smart in, in, in better ways to include um, students who are, you know, in some ways left out because of that cost. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm right on time, uh, 2.30. Uh, I, I'm, I can take a question or two if, if there are any. Uh, if not, my email address is there. Feel free at any point to reach out to me. I'm, I'm always available. I'm always interested in what other people are doing, uh, other projects out there, and opportunities to collaborate and be involved because I believe that it's going to take more than just the folk who are on this call to solve this problem. And then if each one of us can talk to someone, then we can, we can uh, advance this cause because it's very worthy to say that we are trying to find ways to, to, to offer opportunity, real opportunity to students who traditionally don't have those opportunities. Thank you, Esperanza. That was really helpful. Um, much appreciated that you're willing to share your, your um, work with us.
I think at this point we uh, should move on to our next presenter because we're hitting right on that time there. Um, and so we'll we'll do that. There was a question in the chat if you want to um, just address that really quickly. With, with regard to using OpenStax or other OER, have you had any pushback from the universities? Um, so this, it's a great topic maybe for another um, another presentation or at the end of this one. I, I can answer that question very briefly. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's all you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the universities tend to be to be really open to um, to some of these, uh, especially OpenStax. All right. So um, Nikki, you're up. Hi. Okay, so uh, we'll just go to the first slide, So, uh, or we can go on to the next one. I just have some information to tell you a little bit about San Jacinto College. Um, if you can click over, there we go, thank you. Um, so we have uh, been around since 1961 and have four campuses. We're planning to open a fifth campus, which with any luck, um, I'm, I'm already working with them to see if we can't start uh, all open books to begin with. That's my goal to them and my challenge to them. So we are uh, keeping our fingers crossed on that. Uh, we currently have more than 32,000 students at, uh, across all of our campuses and more than 1,700 faculty. So we work with both full and part-time faculty. We are an OpenStax institutional partner like RPCC, which has been very beneficial for us. Uh, we are also an Achieving the Dream Leader College and a 2019 Aspen Prize Top 10 College so we uh, tend to take a lot of projects, uh, have a lot going on, and really focus on student success and uh, getting those projects implemented. If you, and as an administrator, you'll see, um, I came to this party a little bit late. Uh, I was not the initial lead for our open books program. Uh, that was a, a dean who has since uh, gone to another institution. So when I came in, you know, we would, uh, I got to pick up to understand why and, and what the purpose for our program was. Uh, we had initially started with an Achieving the Dream grant. So as we started looking, and yes, you can go ahead and go to that next slide, thank you. We um, found that when you look at our students across the board, uh, so this is our certified data from last fall, we have a majority of female students. Uh, we are also a, a majority minority institution as well. 60% uh, of our population is Hispanic. Um, we have uh, less than half of our students are what you might call traditional age students. And 77% of our students are part-time. So that's a lot of students that are working, uh, you know, coming to school when they can. And then we have a lot of first generation uh, our Pell Grant number is a little low, and, and we think that's a little low as well. We know there are more students that need money, so that's something we're working on. But we do want to reach out and increase the, um, how those students can use the money that they have. If we'll go to the next slide, I just I've included some more detail. Uh, I'm sure many of you are looking and maybe nodding your head. Uh, I was doing that during um, Esperanza's presentation. You know, so many things uh, sounded familiar. 51% you know, of our students are supporting families. Uh, they're worried about paying for college, or they've run out of money, or you know, they can't even get cash for an emergency. So if they're worrying about day-to-day -day life, if they have you know these uh, financial anxieties, or if they have uh, competing demands for dollars, textbooks are are very often the last thing that they're going to choose to spend their money on. Uh, they've paid the tuition, you know, they'll just do what they can to get that uh, from other places. If you'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And we also, and, and this is one of the things that our faculty really understand, and one of the reasons we've been able to be successful is in working with our faculty, um, that a lot of our students have a very low food security. We have uh, food markets on each campus to help students uh, to get uh, money. We have different ways to help them pay for money. 9% of our students are homeless. I, you know, we hear uh, stories of students living in the car or what they're doing to get through school. And again, that generally means that textbooks are, are a low priority for them. And by the faculty seeing this firsthand and reporting and understanding, they are able to, um, we're able to get them to come in and be supportive of this program. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, 
there, there are three things here, and those students think that we are working to help them. You know, they, they see us with, uh, as an institution, reaching out to help them get financial aid or to, uh, you know, to help do what uh, we can to offer scholarships. Uh, and they think that we're working to keep tuition down or tuition affordable. They feel that uh, textbooks are too expensive and they don't see people make, they uh, told us in 2018, they didn't really see uh, the institution making a change or, or fighting to reduce the cost of textbooks. Um, you know, if you go into a bookstore and look at the cost of a new textbook, you will find that um, you'll, you'll get a little bit of sticker shock. I, I remember them being expensive when I went to school, but uh, now it's just it's crazy of what you see. So if you go to the next one, uh, one of the things we've done in the last year and this came as part of uh, working with the uh, OpenStax Institutional Partner Program, is we really begin to focus on the words, the information we were putting out, what, um, what the message was. And uh, we had worked very closely with both our Board of Trustees, who are very supportive of this initiative, and uh, with our faculty, bringing in uh, different faculty as champions or faculty senate. And we, uh, as an institution, and this is actually a goal, one of the goals the trustees has set for the college is to create affordable learning opportunities for our students and to really further that and make sure that we support that. So um, we worked with this and decided our mission was going to be to support faculty to identify quality course materials at low or no cost. We wanted students to be able to focus on learning, not on the cost of textbooks, but we didn't want faculty to see that um, they were being mandated, they were being told they had to do this. We wanted them to know that we understand quality is key, but we wanted to support them with finding the resources that were there and that are uh, quality. So if you'll go to the uh, next slide, we ended up with three different categories. Um, we started in spring 2017 with a grant, as I mentioned, and um, I'm just going to say this first one is by far my favorite. Uh, it's open books or what you traditionally would know as OER. So the students have no cost for these. These are only free. And um, I like to point out when I do presentations around the institution, you know, if I have $100 as a student, the other two options, so they may be discounted, I'm still taking money out of my pocket. If I'm doing open books and OER, I keep all that money in my pocket. So as a student, that's definitely the preference and it's definitely what we look for with our faculty. But if we can't do that, then we do have a couple of other options to really focus on um, getting costs down for students, whether it's uh, working through an inclusive access program, which um, is, is new for us, or faculty even came to us and said, we have uh, worked to get costs down in the course cost materials for our class are, are less than $50. Some of them are $25 or $30. They're not OER, they're not inclusive access. You can just go to the bookstore. They wanted to make sure that students know these are available. And so we now go through and we use, um, to use, um, um, we, we tag these in our catalog throughout and we do a lot of advertising around these so that students will uh, we'll know what these are and we'll look for these classes and you'll see that as we go a little bit further into the presentation. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, you can see the growth that we've had uh, when we started in spring 2017. Uh, you know, we, we had just um, a few students. This is a duplicated headcount, but if you look every spring to spring or every summer to summer, it goes up. Uh, the blue are our open books, totally OER. And then the yellow is the uh, inclusive access and the gray is that open books low cost, which is new. Um, and so if, if you'll go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, um, here's what we found by looking at this and we're working very closely with the research department now to share this information with our faculty to keep them uh, engaged and, and part of this. From that data you were looking at before, this semester, 61% of the students at San Jacinto College are taking at least one open books course. Uh, so it is, uh, you can see on the slide, more than 240 courses have been offered. Uh, and these are both technical and academic transfer, though primarily academic transfer. 
15% of our students are taking only open books courses uh, and there's and uh, about a third of those are taking nine or more hours of open books. We have one student who's taking 18 hours. So we are definitely doing drill down to look at programs to see who's being successful to hold them up as a model um, as we move forward. Um, you know, we're hearing very positive feedback from students as we go uh, through. Um, if you'll go on to the next slide, we've also been able to determine um, that if you remember back to my early slide, 20% of our students are receiving Pell Grants, but uh, a third of the students enrolled in OER are receiving Pell Grants. So that means our financial aid office is working very closely with us and we've uh, purchased some little items to help financial aid be, um, to be involved and, and help us get the word out uh, to give to the students. But these students are going out actively looking for these and uh, signing up for these courses as they go forward. Uh, we are also, um, we know uh, the percentage of females taking open books is higher than our overall percentage. 82% are minority. Um, but I love the last two numbers that a quarter of our first time in college new students have already figured out, hey, this is a great way to take classes, we, that we can save money by doing this. But 62% of the students are continuing students that have taken open books before and come back and continue searching for it. So I, I think that um, says a lot for getting that message out. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, you can see total savings uh, since we've been and uh, we joined, um, we, we became an OpenStax institutional partner in summer of 2018. So you can see how, um, how we've kind of grown since that point uh, from working with them in the direct tactics that they helped help us out with. Um, we have started reaching out, not just to, uh, we go to have all four corners. So we go to our board of trustees, we have a standing present, a yearly presentation, and we do regular updates uh, through other formats to our board of trustees, letting them know what the uh, savings are, what the success is, what the uh, success for students. Uh, we've worked very closely with our instructional administrators and strategic leadership team here at the college to make sure they understand what we're doing and to help push that out. And then uh, we also work with our faculty uh, we go directly to faculty through college assemblies and department meetings and one-on-one. -on -one. And we've added some training. Uh, one of the trainings we found necessary to help faculty be comfortable with this type of tool was helping our faculty understand how to work with digital tools. They're not always comfortable with the digital resources that they can um, get to, you know, they can see. Um, they're more comfortable with that textbook, you know, the, a hard copy of, of something and say turn, turn to page 76 and it doesn't work that same way online. So we found the more comfortable faculty that become, the more they engage student in using the resource. And so now the students are using it. And then we're also putting out a lot of information um, to the students through financial aid. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, purchased these little um, holders, holders that to go on the back of phone which financial aid loves because it fit into their plan and it's not something we normally have to give out. Uh, we work with orientation. We've added uh, posters throughout. Uh, we work with the libraries, have gone to student success fairs and had giveaways for students. And uh, we got some really nice giveaways that they'll come to our table saying, oh, you have the bags. And we'll say, yes, but you have to listen to what we're telling you before you can get the bag. We don't just give those out. Um, and so we've seen students saying, well, what do I look for? We've taught them how to look that up. And um, I, I think that's um, really helped us to do that outreach and, and to have some of the growth that you're seeing now. If you go to the next slide, uh, it has my contact information, but it also has uh, the image you see in the top right. Uh, this is something that we just had made into a lapel pin. And we're going to be giving these out to faculty beginning next week. And so for those faculty who have been working with us, who are doing open books, who are helping us uh, save costs for students, save money for students, uh, we are really going to be uh, making a, a big effort to thank them, to let them know how important they are, and to let them know that they are our champions. And they are the ones out here doing this and making this successful. So um, that's really kind of the wrap up of what I had to present. It's more from an administrative 
viewpoint. That's a little different than Esperanza, but I can answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I think we're going to save the questions until the end because we're, um, I don't want to, I want to make sure to give Lori enough time. So there's a few questions in the chat if you want to answer those in the chat or we can save them for the end. Um, okay. Otherwise, okay. Lori. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. The best is for last. <laughs> so uh, I'm Lori Asap, manager of Open Education at BC Campus. Uh, can you go to the next slide? And uh, so I'm presenting a different perspective here because we are a project. Uh, we are actually an open education project within BC Campus, which is an agency. And so we have a broad view of the entire province of British Columbia. We're like the drop in the pond. And however, we support the faculty uh, interested in open education and education in general in British Columbia uh, has a ripple effect across the landscape. So we want, we want to and we want to consider how we are providing that support and we have incorporated much of what we're talking about today regarding awareness of diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility within our organization. Next slide. So here I say equity starts at home and I can truly say I, I've worked for BC campus since, since its inception and uh, close to the start of the open education project. BC campus is an organization that understands treating its staff well, uh, ha uh, providing flexibility for personal needs. Uh, we have a very caring environment does impact those that we serve within the post-secondary sector. So for example, we have biannual staff retreats and all of these topics we're talking about today, inclusion, diversity, etc., cetera, are uh, practiced and talked about at the retreats. When a job is posted for BC campus, it is also, that is also acknowledged. So as part of the job, description is an invitation to people from uh, equity uh, seeking groups to um, or challenge groups to apply for these jobs as well. Next slide please. These are the core values of BC campus. Um, I don't know if Liz or Suzanne has added a link to the chat but I, I put together a Google Doc with uh, links and references for what I'm talking about. Here is uh, our, our core values, open sharing, access, accept, uh, accountability, quality, and respect. And on the left-hand side is a screenshot from uh, our, one of our upcoming conferences, the Festival of Learning that's happening in May. And you can see the drop down where it says universal access. And these are the areas that uh, we, BC Campus, tries to ensure that everyone can be included and that we invite a diverse audience to our conferences. So child care is provided for people who bring children, a code of conduct, conduct is laid out, accessibility is addressed, uh, gender in terms of uh, dual gender or non-gender bathrooms are offered, and LAP E are uh, scholarships for for educators who want to attend a conference and don't have the financial means. The photo on the right hand side is an elder, an indigenous elder, and so it is also part of our schedule to invite an elder to open the conference, and this is part of our acknowledgement of the traditional territory upon which the conference takes place. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, uh, we we're inviting instructors uh, to understand open ed education through open textbooks. And we started to uh, invite them to review the open textbooks. Um, and since that started three or four years ago, we are now, uh, we have now added a question for them to answer as part of the review 
that takes into account inclusion, equity, et cetera. Next slide, please. So here is a, a, a posting of one of the textbooks. That's one of our authors up on the left there, Charlie Molnar. Um, he didn't write the Canadian history book, but anyway, uh, here's the Canadian history book. You'll see a flag there that says faculty reviewed by the red arrow. Uh, but anyway, one of the questions that we ask faculty says, asks them to reflect, uh, ask them how well the text reflects diversity and inclusion regarding culture, gender, ethnicity, national origin, age, disability, sexual orientation, education, and religion. Next slide. The other part of all of this that we have uh, taken into account is the support and help that we offer to the post-secondary system in British Columbia. Next slide. And one way we've done that is through the support resources that we write and publish. So the most obvious selection is the accessibility toolkit. Um, on the left, it is now in its second edition. It was updated last year. And a couple of the items that were added were a chapter on how to create an accessibility statement. And we are now walking the walk as well. So uh, BC Campus has published dozens of open textbooks and support resources. So over time, we are adding one, ensuring that the book is accessible and marketing and marking it as such, and then also adding an accessibility statement to the book. So that's part of the accessibility remediation. Uh, when we are uh, overseeing or publishing new resources or new textbooks, we make sure we take access accessibility into account at the beginning of the process and we're not retrofitting it. In the appendix of the accessibility toolkit is uh, uh, four recordings of an inclusive design webinar series. And the first one, which I really like, was done by uh, Jess Mitchell from OCAD in Toronto. And she says, design that considers uh, the full range of human diversity is how she would like to see OER designed, where it highlights the importance of creating adaptable and flexible resources that allow people to customize their experience in a way that works best for them, etc. On the right is the self-publishing guide. This is for publishing open textbooks in OER. Uh, added to that is a chapter on accessibility, diversity, and inclusion. And in addition to uh, physical impairments or learning disabilities, we invite people to also consider other uh, barriers for people, such as language comprehension for those for whom English is not a native language or have low literacy, uh, limitations of time and place. Uh, whether you're a working parent or a parent with young children or you live far away from a university or college campus or you are in an area that's remote and you have unreliable or no access to the internet. We have taken a step to address that for our institutions in the far north region of British Columbia and in the interior of the province away from Vancouver, you know, the more populous centers of the province. We now have regional reps for the north, uh, sorry, one regional rep for the north and one for the interior. So they have just started with our project. Hi, this is Jillian. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Oh, hi. Oh, should I continue? Oh, I'm sorry. It's me. Uh, next slide. This is nobody. What's up? On this slide, it shows <gasps> yes. all of. Oh my God. Can somebody turn their, their mic off? <laughs> um, anyways, uh, on this slide, it shows the accessible textbooks that we have in our collection. We have about 300 textbooks and resources in the collection, and now we have 104 that are accessible according to the checklist checklist for accessibility posted in the accessibility toolkit. Next slide, please. Uh, the last thing that we, are, we have done and are currently doing is we ask institutions to consider how they're going to describe and address diversity beyond just offering open 
uh, educational resources and practicing uh, open education in their teaching. Next slide. So a couple of years ago, when we put out a call for grants, um, these are the items that we asked our grantees or applicants to uh, include in their applications. And we say grant proposals are also evaluated for how they might and uh, these items that would be more inclusive to the students that they're serving. Next slide. And uh, so to top it off in response to more inclusion and trying to include the institutions more in the creation, managing, and sustainability of open education in British Columbia. This year, for the first time, we're offering an open education sustainability grant for institutions. And this is the announcement that was made last month. We gave the grant out to two, to, sorry, four institutions. And within that call, we asked the institutions to consider how open educational practices and OER might fit in with their overall strategy on teaching, learning, and scholarship, and how it might incorpor be incorporated into their policy so that uh, it's, as they say, baked into how we um, conduct ourselves in higher education. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, so we have a few minutes for, for questions, about four, but I also wanted to, to um, present a few, a little bit of information, hopefully my mic is better now. Uh, we have, if you're coming to the CCC OER uh, website tab, you can all um, at the link there. And uh, a great place to continue is our EDI blog again at the the CCC OER website um, there's a link on the front page there our next webinars are listed here and open access week 21st to 27th so good information to keep in mind thank you and the open education conference is coming up quite soon as well. Hopefully folks are scheduled for that in Arizona. And um, Open Ed Global also coming up. Thank you. And if you have any questions, um, these are the folks you can contact. So um, like I said, we have about three minutes for questions. Were there any questions in the chat? Does um, anyone want to unmute and ask a question? May I say too, uh, right now BC Campus is accepting uh, proposals for the Festival of Learning that's happening next May in Vancouver. Uh, it, the, I just put a link in the chat. The call will, the deadline is uh, November 15th. Laurie, there weren't necessarily, there was some um, chat happening about um, the appreciation for looking at accessibility and moving in that direction. Yeah, we, uh, we, yeah, we thought it was important, to, partly because uh, that was always our intention as a project, was to uh, kind of lead the way and show people how they can take this on themselves, and it just, it just made sense. And there is a question in the chat about um, recommendations for math OER that's accessible. Um, and I, I will mention one that, that I'm aware of anyway, which is um, My Open Math, which is being developed and is currently in accessibility review and I believe is, um, is, is accessible. And it's My Open Math. Yeah, and if, if you go to our collection as well, let me just uh, give you a link. Uh, there are accessibility flags noted by books that are accessible. Uh, let's see, there is a math and stats section 
divided into different categories. The other place people can look is our OER by discipline directory. And this um, is where we put everything else <laughs> that we find that doesn't fit our collection. So there, again, I, I don't think they're marked by accessibility, but at least there are several resources in math that you can look at. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for all of those fabulous resources that, that BC Campus um, provides. And thank you for to all of our presenters and to everyone here. We are right at one o'clock, so I will um, wrap this up. If there are any questions in the chat, otherwise have a lovely afternoon.